lot to do. Good morning, finally. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Wow, a lot of folks missing this morning. Are there any announcements this morning? Jim, would you like to talk about the men's dinner next week? If you would, please. We've invited the end of the church and their wives to come up to China Grove Family Restaurant next Saturday at 4 o'clock. And uh, if I haven't been able to catch you, please let me know. If you can go, I have to let them know 24 hours before 4 p.m. But as I said, it'll be at 4 o'clock, and uh, we've got a potential group somewhere in the 40s or so people going. So just let me know after the service. We'll let Joel know. Yeah. And uh, we'll put you on the list. Otherwise, he'll be eating what you don't eat. So <laughs> we're, we're looking out for him. So you don't to him. Challenge accepted. <laughs> Any other announcements? Angela? Any others? Then as you are able, let us please stand as the light of Christ enters our midst.
And as you are able, and join with us in singing hymn number 158. 158. joys or prayer requests this morning. I'd like to thank all those who came and walked in the crop walk this past week. We had a good time. When it was over, I said, let's go again. When I got home, I said, let's not. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Any prayer requests? Joys? Blessing to be here. I got some. Um, we still don't know when Dave's surgery is going to be, so remember that. We have a, a good friend that was in our, well, was in his second church, but my first church after we got married. Uh, Minnie Myers, remember the family of her. She was kind of like a mother to me after mom died and a grandmother to our children. She actually came to our house and uh, for me to go to the hospital to have Rosemary stay with the other girls. Um, Remember me, I go uh, weak from Thursday about my knee. It's not, wasn't any fracture they tested that by going to orthopedic. I just hope there's nothing torn in there that I have to have surgery. And just remember our election coming up. Remember Ronnie Wenzel, he had his surgery this past week. They had to remove the entire kidney, uh, but they feel that they got all the cancer. The doctor said that he would not have to have chemo or radiation. So they feel they got it all. Praise God for that, but keep him in your prayers. Any others? Remember Donna and her family, they're on the way home from Pigeon Forge. Donna and her family as they are traveling back home. Any others? 
If you have an unspoken request this morning, let it be known by your sign of surrender. Lord, it's been another one of those weeks. But I know you are with me, so I give it to you. I surrender all. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this day. The day that you have made. A day that we have gathered together and we will worship and rejoice in it. And Father, we do that right now. We thank you for all the things you have given us in life. We thank you for our families. We thank you for this church. We thank you for the people who are gathered here. Sometimes that's all we can say is just thank you. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for the blessings of life. Thank you for your word that you inspired. Thank you. Thank you for being the kind of father that, that can still heal, that still hears his children crying out when they need healing. Thank you for the healing touch. And Lord, there are some that, that need that touch whether they be traveling back home, whether they be recovering from cancer surgery, whether they are just sick with COVID or whether they are sick with whatever, Lord. We know the one that created the body. We know the one that is all powerful. We know the great physician. Heal according to your plan. Father, I ask that you bless this church. Be with us as decisions are made. Be with this denomination. Be with us as your people. Now, Father, we leave these petitions, whether spoken or unspoken, in your holy hands, and we claim them done by praying in the manner in which your Son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand as you are able as we reaffirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed located on page 881. <coughs> Please, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. standing as our tithes and offerings are brought forward.
you for this offering. We ask your blessings upon it and upon those who gave. And Lord, those who were unable to give, we ask a double blessing upon them. Let this offering be used for the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout our country, our community, and our world. And let the church say, Amen. You may be seated. something a, a little more contemporary. It's by uh, Michael W. Smith. who has been doing this stuff for a long time. He's an excellent uh, writer. And uh, the name of the song is Breathe.
to have some more of that. Yes. Yeah. Love that music. Love it. Praise the Lord. This morning, we're going to be talking about this. How many believe this, this was inspired by God? Yeah. All scripture is inspired by God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning of, at verse 14 and reading all the way through chapter 4, verse 5. Don't worry, it's not, not a lot. Sounds like a lot, but it's not. Again, 2 Timothy, beginning at chapter 3, verse 14. And I will be reading from the Revised Standard Version. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning at verse 14, going all the way through chapter 4, verse number 5. We'll give our folks at home just a, a minute or so to find 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 through chapter 4, verse 5. And as you are able, let us please stand at the reading of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through chapter 4, verse 5. And again, I'm reading from the Revised Standard Version. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to instruct you for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom preach the word be urgent in season and out of season convince rebuke and exhort be unfailing in patience and teaching for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching but having itching ears that they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own likings and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander into myths. As for you, always be ready. Endure suffering. Do the work of the evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. The word of God for us, the people of God. You may be seated. A pastor tells a story that he was sitting in a repair shop having his car worked on. And it was during the time that a, a very popular, very famous TV evangelist had his morning television show. So he sits down and he starts watching the show. And they were talking about the war in Iraq. And the televangelist, and a lot of you know that this is one of my, my pet peeves, but I, 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 let's move on. <laughs> The televangelist says, you know what we ought to do? We ought to starve those Iraqis to death. That would solve the problem. And the pastor says, starve men, women, children, widows, orphans, people who were created in the image of God, people who possess infinite sacred worth simply because God loves them. And you want to starve them to death? The pastor said it was all he could do to keep from getting sick right then and there. The pastor then asked one of the employees if he could turn the channel and he quickly changed it when he was told that he could. Now, I want to ask you this morning, is this the teaching of Christ Jesus? No. Absolutely not. Can can you imagine Jesus telling his followers to starve anyone or even to hurt anyone? I can't imagine that. I mean, it's Jesus we're talking about. It is Jesus who, who cautions us not to even be angry with one another. 
It is Jesus who tells us, says, you have heard it said, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn them also the other. It is Jesus who tells us, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. It's also Jesus who tells us, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, he said. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And as as you've heard me say many times, I love me some me. Oh, y'all act like y'all don't. Let me, well, let me put it this way. If you get hungry, what do you do? <coughs> so then by that same logic, if your neighbor is hungry, what should you do? Thank you. In our scripture lesson this morning, Paul warns his young protege, Timothy. The time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. He goes on to basically tell Timothy this as well. These false teachers will teach what they think people will want them or want to hear and actually use the scriptures themselves to to manipulate and to control. And also remember Jesus told us, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. I'm afraid in our world today, in our faith today, in our church today, we do have many wolves in sheep's clothing who are using and manipulating the scriptures for an agenda that is so far from the gospel of Jesus Christ that, well, be bluntly honest, folks, we got to watch out. A little more than 2,600 years ago, a young man of eight years old ascended the throne of one of the most powerful nations in the world. For 17 years, he ruled his country the best he could. But to this point, his reign was unsuccessful. The country was in turmoil. The theological foundation of the country had eroded. Morality was non-existent. Idols were worshipped everywhere. The temple was neglected and the once powerful country was in sharp decline. Sounds familiar, huh? But something happened. A wonderful event happened that turned the reign of this young king around and made him one of the most revered individuals in the history of this nation. The country turned around economically, politically, and spiritually. Everything started to mushroom for the good in the country. And you might ask, what was this simple act that turned this country around? Well, first let me tell you who I'm talking about. I'm talking about Josiah. And we find his story written in the book that we now call Second Kings. And the story goes on as a priest was one day walking in a lonely and neglected part of the temple. And he found a book. The book of the law. The book of life. The book that we now call Deuteronomy. The word of God. It was the rediscovery of the word of God that turned this entire nation around. But folks, here's a warning. Where was the Word of God found? This is the interactive part as well. Where was it found? In the church. This neglected book, this neglected Word was found in the church. The church is where the Word of God had been neglected. It was in the church where the Word of God was being ignored and left on a dusty table. Does this sound familiar? Is it happening today? 
So what are we going to do that we at Mount Mitchell and we as Christian people, wherever we may be in and wherever we are watching, what are we going to do so that this does not happen to us? Paul's solution for this upcoming peril was for his protege to accept the charge to be firm in the word. Listen to what he tells Timothy. In the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. And in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Stand firm in the Lord. Stand firm in his word and keep preaching and teaching. Correcting and rebuking and encouraging with great patience. And sound, careful instruction. But before Timothy could accept the charge about the word, he had to be changed by the word. And folks, the same goes for us and for anyone else. Are we in our Christian walk being continually, continually changed by the very word that we are charged to keep? Or do we still hold a, a shallow view of the Bible and of the world? Do we pick and choose the passages that make us feel good or that our itching ears want to hear? Or are we keeping our heads in all situations? As Christians, we must not just own a Bible or use the Bible. We must allow the Bible to be the inspired word that it is. I'm going to say that again because it's important. As Christians, we must not just own a Bible or use the Bible. We must allow the Bible to be the inspired word that it is. As Paul tells us in the Verse 16 of 2 Timothy chapter 3. He says that all scripture, this is a different translation. All scripture is God breathed, which means inspired. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Now, first of all and most of all, the Bible is inspired because it works. It works. Changes lives. How many here today's lives have been changed because of the inspired word of God? It changes lives. And it changes lives because God will not leave it alone. He has been and will be in every aspect of this word's existence. And as I said earlier, the word inspiration means God breathed. Now, how, just how does God inspire? Did he lock the biblical writers in a cave, put them in a trance, and di dictate every word, jot, and tittle? Before I go any further, does everyone know where the jot, jot and tittle is? No? Well, for those of you who don't know, you're going to leave here knowing. A jot. The small, very smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It's like our comma. It's written a little slash above the line. But it's a letter. That's the job. You'll see it above the line like an apostrophe in our language. A tittle. This one's a little more different. Say this is a Hebrew letter. And there's another one just like it except for it's like this. It has a little overhang, a little further pen stroke. This little overhang, the little part that's wiggling there, is the tittle. And there's something like it in our alphabet. What differentiates the O and the Q? That little wiggly thing, right? It's a tittle. So now does everyone know what a jot and tittle is? The smallest little things in, in the Hebrew Bible. Even these little things were inspired by God. Oh, I could preach on that all day. 
The smallest of things in the word of God is inspired. And how did God inspire Jesus? Could there be a connection in all this? It's my understanding that, that the Father inspired the Son through everyday life events. Jesus wasn't a mechanical superman or a, or a spiritual robot. If so, then why did he have to pray so much? He said, yes, I, I'm bringing out the humanity of Jesus. Why did he struggle with the kind of ministry that he was to have and what was going to happen? As we see in the temptation experiment, experience in the desert. Why did he struggle with God's call for his life? As we see in the garden of Gethsemane where it says, Not my will, Lord, but thine be done. It was during the everyday experiences of living that Jesus nurtured his relationship with the Father. There, in those experiences, he exercised his faith and received the word from God. Well, isn't that how we're supposed to live our lives? I mean, the Holy Spirit's still alive today, is he not? And doesn't he operate in our lives in order to reveal the truth of God and to help us recognize God's truth when we see it? The Holy Spirit shows us the truth of God. And the Holy Spirit shows us God through the Word. This is God's book from beginning to end Every jot and every till. And it is God who, who is seen in the Bible. And it is God who speaks to us through the Bible. God has revealed his, his personality and His nature through this Word of God. And the most important revelation, the ultimate revelation of God is seen in His Son, Christ Jesus. If you want to know what God looks like, if you want to know the nature of God, look at the Son. If anyone has an idea that is different from the revelation of God we see in Christ Jesus, it is untrue. Christ Jesus is the criteria in which all of Scripture must be interpreted. We can only understand the Bible if we understand it through the eyes of our faith in Christ. It's not enough just to, to know the Bible. The key to unlocking the, the meaning of the Bible is the spirit and love of the Lord Jesus Christ as He lives in our hearts and as we live for Him by faith. Does that sound like a struggle? How many here have struggled since you became a Christian? How many has had no problems? It's been all the rose garden. That's what I thought. Yes, it's a struggle. Now, now what, to, what do I mean when I use that word struggle? Here's the definition that I'm using. Something that can only be accomplished with great effort. And you might say, well, that's what makes part of the Christian life so fun, so challenging and exciting. I don't think that we can properly read, interpret and apply the Bible without a certain struggle. And I believe it was true with Jesus. I believe that Christ, and this might be some controversial statements, I believe that Christ struggled with Scripture. It was, now remember the definition I used, something that can only be accomplished with great effort. So it took great effort for Christ. Do you believe that? Well, let's go to that temptation event. What did the devil use to tempt Christ? Did he not use scripture to tempt him? And with great struggle, Christ replied and overcame each and every time with great effort.
Now, so let's look at the thought and the vision of a Messiah back at this time in Jesus' time. What they thought it might should be. One was the ideal of, and both were in scripture. One was the idea of a strong militaristic, nationalistic Messiah who would come in with the sword and destroy all the enemies of Israel. The other was the concept of the suffering servant. One who would come and be despised and rejected and would lay down his life as a sacrifice for the nation. And this is found in the book of Isaiah. I don't think that, that Jesus' greatest struggle was with sin. I don't believe it was with Satan. I don't believe it was with the scribes and the Pharisees or even the Roman army. I think he struggled with the will of God in the scripture. It took great effort on his behalf, just as it takes us great effort. It was trying to discern where God was leading him and the kind of ministry that he was to have. We as pastors and you as, as God's Christ, as children also struggle with this. What is God calling me to do? What does he want of me? Well, I've got a little age on me. What can I do? Well, I love to talk. I could pick up a phone and call somebody. It's a struggle. And yes, Christ, I believe, went through this very same struggle. And if Jesus had to struggle with Scripture, then you better believe that you and I are going to struggle as well. And Paul goes on to say, and he says, all Scripture is inspired. And will make you wise unto wholeness. It is useful for teaching. It is the core around which we instruct, lead, and guide. The scripture is for rebuking. Which is to show us where we are wrong. The scripture is able to correct. And show us how to do right. The scripture is able to instruct us in righteousness to put us in a right stance with God and in a right relationship with other human beings. So that the men and women of God might be completely equipped for everything that God has called you to do. So how do we, the church of Christ, interpret the Bible? How do we keep with sound doctrine? For one thing, we need to pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. God wants us to understand His Word. I don't believe that He wants us to go through it and say, well, this shouldn't have been put there and put over here in a bin. We can take that out. I don't think He wants us to go through and say, well, this does not apply to us today and take it away and put it over here in another bin. Again, the inspired Word of God, every jot and every tittle. And to better understand the Word of God, we need to choose a definite place and time for reading and studying. Because consistency builds our relationship and our understanding of God and His Word. And as we seek God through our study and through our day, it's helpful for some to, to keep a journal and at the end of the day ask the question, how have I experienced God today? Because knowing that we are accountable at the end of the day to answer that question will cause us to be more sensitive to God's movement throughout everything we have done that day. And decided to do. Another thing that we need to do. Is to remember that our Christian journey. Is just that. A journey. It's a lifelong struggle. With scripture. And God's call in our life. We will never ever in this lifetime. Know it all. Or have all the answers. But we can be sure of one thing. Jesus Christ is love, 
because God is love. And Jesus Christ would never do anything to hurt another human being in any way. And we are to allow the Holy Spirit to mold our lives after that life that is Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, the Prince of Peace, the Suffering Servant. The inspired word of God. Every jot. Every tittle. And let the people of God say. Please stand as you are able and join with us in singing hymn number 127. Let us receive the benediction. Grant us, O God, a mind to meditate on them, eyes to behold you, ears to listen to your word, a heart to love you, and a life to proclaim you through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ our Lord. And let the church say, Amen.